Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to discuss with you a subject that is so dear to my heart. 200 years ago, if we had sat here, all of us, you would have looked at your neighbor. One out of three people would have died before the age of 30. 200 years ago, our yields of cereals in the world were at the most one and a half tons per hectare. Today, Life expectancy is nearing 80 in many parts of the world. Today, the best yields are around 8 or sometimes even 10 tons per hectare of cereals. That tremendous advance was possible through a combination of science, of government policy, of innovation, and of collaboration. Today, again, we face new challenges. By 2050, according to all accounts, we'll probably have 9 billion people on this earth. By 2050, the demand for the food of the urban population, of whom we'll have 60% of those 9 billion who live in cities, will be a demand for animal proteins, for milk, for meat, and to a lesser extent also for vegetables. Today, as I talk, we have 1 billion people who are still undernourished, one billion who have enough calories but not enough micronutrients. But we also have one and a half billion who are obese or badly nourished. In other words, three and a half billion out of the seven billion we have today on this world have a problem with food. And that, I think, is a real challenge. How do we deal with that? Well, it's very clear that we can feed those nine billion. I think there's no scientist who in his right mind doubts that. But a couple of things need, need to be done. First of all, in my view, we need to push for serious innovation. The things that have worked so well since the 1960s, the combination of plant nutrients, of water, of credits, of infrastructure development, need to be reinvented in some ways. Um, We've done a great deal with the so-called Green Revolution, but we also see the effects leveling off. We need to find new ways to produce food sustainably. And with sustainable, I also mean sustainable in a social sense. And there is a big problem there that I want to put right in front of you here, and that is that we have a declining and rapidly declining population working in agriculture. Fewer young people want to be agriculturalists. And there's nothing so devastating for the recruitment of young people to put an emphasis on small is beautiful and do it by hand. I'm saying this provocatively because I think one of the, the, the fallacies of the current debate on the modernization of agriculture is that we should go back to some kind of a return to um, traditional agriculture as if small is beautiful. I think the only way we can get young people to produce the food for those nine billions is to stimulate entrepreneurship and stimulate innovation and stimulate the, the, the funding of agriculture. And this is not what we're doing. We have nothing that, that looks even remotely like a strategy, either nationally or internationally. Very few countries have a strategy in place. So to feed those nine billion, let me deal with what needs to be done, because after all we're talking here about global governance, what needs to be done internationally and nationally. I think the first thing that faces us is a continuing situation today of highly fluctuating food prices. These prices, as you know, these fluctuations are very much a combination of structural underinvestment in agriculture in the last 20 years, including indeed by the World Bank, of uh, a number of contingencies, uh, climate or weather fluctuations in particular, and of uh, misguided policies by governments. If Russia closes its borders for uh, export of grain, as it did uh, after the drought and the fires in uh, last, not this summer, the summer before, if Thailand closes its border for the export of rice, 
although Thailand is the largest exporter of rice, this has an immediate impact on the world market. And if these fluctuations are very difficult to deal with. I am not so worried about food prices themselves going up. In fact, they were at a historical low in the year 2001 before these fluctuations started. Food prices worldwide on the world markets have declined with 1% since 1948. And it's very logical that we see readjustment. But what farmers cannot deal with and what food processors cannot deal with are heavy fluctuations. So the first question that I'm putting on the table is how can we better use the positive side of food price fluctuations to channel investments, because it's also an opportunity, it's not just only a tragedy, to channel investments into agriculture to make sure that the natural balance or rebalancing in the markets will take place by producing more food if there's a shortage as expressed by prices. Secondly, what needs to be done and discussed internationally is also that we make sure that we somehow finalize the Doha round I will not go into the details of that, but this is a real burden in the international relations on agriculture, and <clears throat> I think the Europeans and the US have to face up with that, <coughs> excuse me, in one way or other. But more importantly, we should look very seriously at the regulations that we now have in place internationally. I think we have done some very good things, um, particularly in the area of food safety, in, in a number of areas where um, you know, agreements, for example, on pesticide residues, agreements on contaminants are all put in place. We also know how to deal with that. But we haven't taken the next step to really ask ourselves, can we ha have a set of rules and regulations in the sector as a whole throughout the food chain on sustainable <coughs> production? Um, this is the week, as you know, of Durban. We all expect that Durban will not yield is very much in terms of a new Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol. At the same time, I see the food sector really taking its responsibility when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, when it comes to reducing energy use, when it comes to recycling, retrieval, etc. I'm fully convinced that we can go to much more closed cycles in the agriculture production, including the retrieval of things like phosphate, the reduction of nitrogen loads. Um, don't forget that in some countries, 90% of the nitrogen fertilizer actually does not reach the plant and the consumer. And hence, there's, a, there's an enormous amount we can do with our current knowledge. But the big item that remains when it comes to regulations is the problem on uh, GMOs, on genetically modified organisms, on which, as you know, Europe has a very conservative stance, whereas the, um, the growth in most countries that we still happen to call developing and emerging markets is very much in that area. And we need to find a way to deal with it without uh, falsifying the markets. I think the general issue on the markets is that we should find ways to deal with the negative effects of globalization for certain groups of people, the poor, the more vulnerable, but at the same time make sure that we don't have artificial barriers. If there's one thing that the globalization has taught us is that we can actually have a far better um, trade of agriculture products that actually now needs to meet also sustainability criteria. So let me perhaps stop here and ask uh, perhaps the, the, the most difficult question to which I don't have a real answer also in terms of governance. There is a cry in many circles, um, including the G20, for regulating food prices. It seems to me that we have uh, very little evidence that this is going to work. There are reports, including from the World Bank, that this is not a good idea. Um, <clears throat> the past is littered with attempts to, to create buffer zones and buffer uh, supplies. But somehow, of course, if we look at history, it's very clear that certain countries, including the US, Canada, and most OECD countries, have and still are protecting their farmers. So somehow, in order for, for agriculture to bloom, there needs to be some way to make sure that we make this step into a sustainable agriculture that is competitive, that attracts young people, that's entrepreneurial, and that in attracts indeed the right types of investment. Lastly, this will not happen only by farmers alone. If there's one trend we see today very strongly in the world markets, 
and, and also nationally, it is the integration throughout the whole food chain with the um, fluctuating resources and resource prices, food companies are actually buying land, renting land, buying up uh, contracts with farmers, and we see that all the way. The retailers, the large retailers, the Walmarts of this world, are actually dominating the farmer's market more than anybody would ever have believed 10 years ago. So there is, I think, a whole shift in the agricultural landscape. The question is, how can we put the governance in place to make sure that it actually benefits those two billion who are not well fed, that it allows us to produce food in a sustainable way and to really make sure that by 2050 we have everybody fed as far as possible. I think it can be done, but we're not yet there. Thank you.